Hello friends, this is chapter 13, uh, the brain and cranial nerves. Um, we'll start off with embryonic development of the brain and quickly move on to the brain itself. Uh, there's a reason that they call things that are difficult uh, brain surgery, or they refer to difficult things or simple things as it's not brain surgery because the brain is very complicated. Uh, this is a 52 page chapter and I'm going to reduce it to two lectures. So. We're not, you're not going to be brain surgeons after this, okay? Just kind of have your, you'll know your way around it, I hope. All right, so first off, when you were a little embryo, you were just a little patch of tissue, you were just cells, and then those cells began to differentiate, and eventually you, in, you went into a process called neurulation, and neurulation is the formation of the nervous system. The nervous system actually forms from ectoderm, so the epithelial tissue it actually invaginates. So if I was a little embryo, if you pictured my, let's say this, let's just say my cell phone was a little embryo, okay? Um, it's got a thickness and a width and it's got a length and so this would be the longitudinal axis of this embryo. Well the back, if I, if I was to take a, like a knife or something and crease the back or if this was like a, maybe my, my, if this thing was made out of bread dough it would be a better example. And I put a crease in the back, you'd see a little, a little uh, groove form in that thing. So this little embryo, I'm going to draw it like if you, if you drew it lengthwise it would look like a little disc, embryonic disc. Right? And so that's my cell phone representation, kind of. So then I'm going to put a little crease in the back here, and it's going to make a little groove. Well, if I look at this guy end on, this guy looks just like this, right? So this first region, this area right here, is what's called the neural plate. And it's just this flat bit of tissue that runs the length of the organism, and it's going to invaginate and form the nervous system. As that plate invaginates, it forms what they call a neural groove. So that's represented by this line. So it's going to be a, a longitudinal dent all the way down the dorsal surface of that organism. And then ultimately it, it invaginates so much that the edges meet around the top. So you get something like this, like, like that. So this right here, this little tube, is what ultimately becomes your central nervous system. That's, there's cells around the outside here that become neurons and it develops into the, your, your, all of the parts of your brain with that tube that runs down the middle being all these tubes in your brain that hold stuff called cerebrospinal fluid, which we'll get to eventually. So I'll, I'll, I'll refer you to this image on the, the, on the screen over here. And so you can see on the very left over here, this is that neural tube. So imagine that there's an embryo around it, right? It doesn't have arms and legs or anything. It's just a real simple little organism. It's barely, barely developing. Now we're only going to look at the anterior portion of this of this tube. So this is the, the head end of this organism, of this little developing uh, embryo. So you see we have week four. So this is an embryo. And these structures here, they call primary brain vesicles. So don't get vesicle and ventricle confused. They sound the same. They both hold liquid. Uh, but this is sort of the, the primordial brain uh, regions, all right? Uh, and you do have to know these names. So prosencephalon, or forebrain, is at the front. Mesencephalon, or midbrain, is in the middle. And rhombencephalon, or hindbrain, is at the end. And then this thing down here would be your spinal cord, right? And you can see, if you look over here, I'm, I'm not going to have you learn any parts of this. Don't worry about it. But this is just kind of a middle step where the telencephalon starts to bulge out. Uh, but do pay attention to this column over here, because this is going to tell you what these regions become. So you can see that this prosencephalon becomes the cerebrum, which is the main part. If you think of the brain, you're thinking of the cerebrum. It's the wrinkly brain looking thing. Uh, the prosencephalon also becomes this structure called the diencephalon, which we'll get to somewhat later, uh, which has its own little subregions, which we'll talk about. Mesencephalon becomes the brainstem uh, or, or midbrain. And the rhombencephalon becomes all these things sort of at the back and bottom of your brain. So you're part of your brainstem, uh, the pons part. Uh, part of your brainstem, the medulla oblongata, and then this weird kind of oddball called the cere cerebellum, which is kind of like, it looks like a little add-on, looks like an extra addition on your brain, like they built it later. And everything below that is spinal cord. Now here are those, they say, adult neural canal regions. These are, these are ventricles. So there's two lateral ventricles, then one, two, uh, a third one, and a connector, and a fourth one, and then a connection down to the, to the spinal cord. And I'll talk about these guys much later as well. So let's move over to the, or actually, sorry, let's move on to protection and support. And so I want to go to an image here. 
of these uh, protective layers called meninges. So it doesn't actually write meninges up here, but I'll, I'll, I've written it over there when we get to the board. But you can see that there are, uh, there's three of them. There's, and they all have the name mater, right? So there is the dura mater, which is most close to the brain, right? So you've got, or most close to the skull, I should say, sorry. So here's two layers of the dura mater, and there's your skull right there. And there's this guy's uh, recently put in hair plugs, apparently. Uh, but the dura, ma dura mater means tough mother. So it's an external tough layer. Uh, inside of that is what's called the arachnoid mater. And if you know what arachnoid root is, that's spider. So it means spider, spider mother. And the reason they call it the spider mother is because you can see these little extensions, these uh, what they call trabeculae, but you don't have to know that. And in this little chamber here is where you keep a lot of cerebrospinal fluid, this little subarachnoid space. You see these little bulges into this uh, dural sinus right here. This allows uh, cerebrospinal fluid to leave the, the tubes that it's in and go back into the bloodstream and then it gets recycled ultimately by, by other cells. And lastly is the pia mater, which means gentle mother. And you can see that the pia mater is the one that's actually stuck, it's this blue one. It's the one that's actually stuck to the surface of the brain and it goes, follows all those little wrinkles and grooves. Uh, know the three, know their kind of sequence, uh, and that's good enough. So let's go, let's go over yonder here and we'll talk, we'll just see, show you what, how you spell meninges. So there's the meninges, there's the three that I had already described. And you can see that it's under the, the, the heading protection and support. So these meninges are protective, uh, both physically and, uh, uh, and emotionally, no, and chemically. So they'll, they'll, they, they'll contain and maintain the cerebrospinal fluid to an, to an extent, and they also do physically uh, support the brain. Now that cerebrospinal fluid stuff, it has several jobs, and I've written the, the, kind of the important ones out here. Cushions uh, provides a certain ionic environment for the brain. The brain's floating in water, therefore buoyancy. You're, you literally are floating in a couple of millimeters. The brain's literally floating in a couple of millimeters of, of this cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, it cleans it out. It's constantly being recycled and filtered and recycled and filtered. So you get brand new cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, it's something like 500 mils a day. So you really go through, you know, go back to the blood, go back to the cerebral spinal fluid, go back to the blood, go back to the cerebral spinal fluid. It's produced in little regions, little patches of cells in the ventricles called choroid plexuses. Now you, you, you've heard that term from lab, I'm sure, but the choroid plexuses are patches of these cells, which we talked about in the last video which are ependymal cells, which are one of those neuroglial cells. So the ependymal cells are found in these little patches called choroid plexuses, and they produce the cerebrospinal fluid. They actually filter it out of the blood, and the, the plasma that they use becomes cerebrospinal fluid. That's kind of a repeating theme in anatomy and physiology. Your lymph and various, your saliva, all these things are, your urine, all these things are derived from your blood. Last protective uh, uh, device, I guess, would be what's called the blood-brain barrier. And so the blood-brain barrier, which is fun to say, consists of three basic layers. You've got the capillaries that you know, supply the brain with blood, and you've got the basal lamina, which is the layer of the, the connective tissue layer that's around those capillaries. Oh, by the way, the endothelium, that's the simple squamous cells that, are, that make up the inside of a blood vessel. The basal lamina is the next layer out. And then you've got these astrocytes. And astrocytes kind of are the security guards for the, for the, the blood that comes to the brain. Uh, if you picture the blood that supplies my skin, there, the capillaries run right in and about those tissues. So if I get a cut or if I get injured, which you do quite often, um, there's an infection that can be introduced to my, to my skin or to my muscle or to my connective tissue. Uh, which is okay because we have mechanisms built to defend ourselves. We have immune system cells and we have the inflammatory response and we can produce uh, phagocytes to go there and scarf it up. But one of the side effects of an infection is swelling. So my, if I get an infection in my arm or whatever, or my leg inside of my abdomen even, that certain amount of swelling can be tolerated. If you get a uh, swelling in this, melan in this cage up here, it's not gonna work out very well for you. So you really wanna protect the brain, which is why you've got this kind of multi-layered protection. Uh, you let through lipids and you let through oxygen, you let through sugar, 
Um, you let through all these, the, the stuff that your brain needs, but you don't allow it to get, if you get an infection in my blood, that blood-brain barrier is going to keep those bacteria away from my brain. All right, now let's go back over to the cerebrum, over here to, the, to this uh, screen up here, because that's where we're going to start off. We're going to start off with the cerebral lobes. And up here we see, we see four out of five of them, but then we also see some other stuff, which we'll talk about later. Frontal, parietal, occipital, temporal, and there's a fifth, which I'll show up on the, on the whiteboard in a minute, called the insula, I-N-S-U-L-A. You will see that. So these are some of the things that I'll talk about later. These are kind of just general functions for these lobes. Now, there's a lot of uh, division of labor, but it's not uh, totally exclusive. It's not like you can say the frontal lobe is solely responsible for uh, communication, because it's not. It says verbal communication, some of it, right? You're actually, when you, when you generate speech, when I say blah, 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 I'm using a region in my frontal lobe to do that. However, when I'm thinking about what I'm saying or understanding somebody else's words, I'm going to use something in the parietal lobe. So there's a bit of, you know, teamwork that's involved, right? They're not all isolated things. So it's hard to just say this is for that and this is for that. So keep, take this with a grain of salt when you, when you study this table. Uh, this is, I'll show you this because this is kind of an, a fairly simple uh, view of the cerebrum and it's left off some things. This particular image I grabbed decided to leave these off for whatever reason, but you're not going to have to identify where these things are. I just want to kind of give you an idea of the relationship between this table and this image. So let's look at this right here, primary motor cortex, right? On the pre-central gyrus. So let's find that. This right here is the pre-central gyrus. And they call it pre-central because there's a little crease running down here called the central sulcus. So a sulcus is a groove, a gyrus is a bulge, so the pre-central gyrus is located right in front of that central sulcus. And if I draw a line, if I follow a line over here, it says primary motor cortex, which there we have it. So don't get too obsessed with trying to figure out where all these things are. You may have to do some of that in lab uh, to a greater extent than in here. I just want you to kind of, I'm going to go over some of these regions and get you to know their, their functions. Where they are is useful, but uh, you're not going to remember it. You know, I don't remember it until I look at this image either. So, so let's just go with that uh, assumption. So let's go, let's go over to the board now again, where I'll talk a little bit about these, uh, these lobes. So there's the, there's the one, two, three, four lobes that you saw up on, this, on the table. And I, as you saw, as you see, I said C table. So see the, the photograph, uh, the image of that, uh, of, that, of that slide. And then I've got the insula in here. Now the insula is hidden underneath the surface. So it's kind of like a, a secret lobe. So if I take, if, I, if you're looking at the side of my head and I've got my frontal lobe kind of here, my parietal lobe kind of here, my temporal lobe kind of here, and if I was to peel back that temporal lobe and look underneath it, I would see the insula. And so that insula has a fairly limited uh, function as far as we know. Can't study it as well because you can't, it's hard to hook up uh, electrodes and measure electrical activity in it because it's, it's, it's buried. But we do have it kind of down to where it serves some memory functions and it is your primary taste, uh, primary gustatory or taste um, region. So when you're when you're eating something and it tastes good or bad, that, that thought, that your, your opinion of that food uh, is being processed in that insular lobe. And then you probably remember what it tastes like using it too. So two birds with one lobe. Uh, I, I mentioned the word cortex here because most of the stuff I'm going to be talking about is the cortical or cortex material. The cortex uh, is cell bodies and they call it gray matter because if you remember my talk about myelination, myelinated stuff, axons, appear white. The matter, the tissue appears white or eggshell at best. Um, the other parts, the cell bodies, appear gray or beige. Uh, and those are the parts that do all of the processing. So those are the guys that are, those are the regions that are, that are that are really doing all those graded potentials and sending, you know, sending impulses down the axons. So it's kind of the 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 the, the, uh, the motherboard of your brain. 
these, the cortex, the external surface cell body region of your, of your cerebrum has, as I say, many functional areas. So I'm gonna kind of go through a select list of those functional areas and give you an idea uh, of what they do. Now you'll notice I've only got there there's bullet points and I'm going to talk about it so you might want to jot down some notes here like hit pause or write some stuff down. So your primary motor cortex is that was that one that was on that pre-central gyrus. So that's going to be if I was going to draw it on my brain it would be like a region that goes left and right just in front of that central sulcus. Uh, and this is responsible for all of my my direct motor control over my muscles. So when I when I close my hand around this stick, that was accomplished primarily by impulses sent from that primary motor cortex. The premotor cortex lies just in front of that, and this is going to be where you can uh, you 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 basically send out impulses for stuff that is uh, learned. I guess learned behaviors. So things that you've picked up over your life. It doesn't. This is not a learned behavior, right? This, when you were born, you did that. This is kind of basic wiring, right? You can contract muscles. But this is a learned behavior. So let's see if I can do it first try. And it's all right, so let's try again. So I dare you to try that. But that is not something that I could do on my first try. I probably made my whole class miserable during seventh grade because I, I was doing it with pens and I was dropping them constantly. And eventually kids would be like, stop it. Or the teacher would be like, who keeps dropping their pen? So my premotor cortex lets me do that. It lets me ride a bike, lets me juggle, lets me, uh, you know, uh, floss. I can floss. I may not show you this now, but we'll see. You might, if you're in my class, you've seen it. Um, all right, Broca area. This is your motor speech area. This is uh, a region that uh, gener moves the muscles for my, for my speaking, all right? Now, it doesn't come up with the words and it doesn't under, it's not the region that understands those words, but it's the region, it gets information from the region that's coming up with the words, and then it generates the impulses to move that, uh, move those muscles. And the frontal eye field is, does, what it, does what it says it does, and that's control eye movement. So as you get impulses in, as you get images in, you respond to them and move, move your eyes around uh, to see them. Then we'll move to the sensory parts of the brain. And if you'll, when you, when you go back to that, um, to that image, you'll see that the motor stuff's kind of all up here in the frontal area, and the sensory stuff's all kind of parietal or occipital uh, or temporal. But let's go over some, and there's a lot here. Some of them are pretty easy. Primary somatosensory cortex. Somatosensory, that means body senses. So when I hit my hand with this thing, that those sensory neurons that travel up my arm, to my spinal cord, up to my brain, that sensation is being processed up there. I actually don't feel it in my hand, which is weird. Your brain convinces you that you're feeling it in your hand so that you'll move your hand out of the way. But your, your brain's the part that gets the, that gets that, uh, gets that, imp that uh, sensation. So then you have your somatosensory association area. This one is going to give you more subtle information rather than just this, you know, there's something poking me it's going to be how hard is it poking me. It's going to give you some, a readout on the, the, the amount of pressure. It's going to tell you if you're experiencing pain, if it gets too hard. Um, it, it lets you feel uh, textures of stuff. So my, the inside of my arm feels different than the back side of my arm because the back side here's got hair and I can feel the difference there. And that's that somatosensory association area. Then we're going to go into a list of just basic like senses. This is what you think of when you think of your Five senses, is that how many you're supposed to have? So uh, visual sensory area, auditory is, is hearing, right? So sight, uh, sound, uh, smell, olfactory, taste, the gustatory, this is that one that was in the uh, insula. Your visceral sensory area. It's a lot more, you don't, you don't get as much information back from those areas. If you remember, they have the, the group B and C fibers. So it's kind of just like, well, you know, if you get a chance, think about this to your brain. Uh, stuff like you're hungry or you're full or your bladder's full or you've got 
uh, gas or you know any number of these different sensations that you can get back from your viscera, you've got heart you know s heartburn. Um, those are going to be processed there. And lastly, the vestibular uh, cortex is something which we haven't learned about hearing and balance yet. But when you uh, there's a there's a structure in your brain called the uh, vestibule. It's called the vestibulocochlear apparatus, and it it is able it's responsible for your your hearing and balance. And the vestibular part, the vestibule is the part that's important for for balance and equilibrium. So when I tip forward there's a region of my brain that gets that information and tells me I'm tipping forward. Or if I spin around in a circle and I get a little dizzy, it'll tell me, okay, you just spun around in a circle. I would like to go back to the board for, or back to the screen for another thing. Sorry, cam sorry, camera bry. Because this is cool and it looks weird. So what it is, is this is, see how it says motor map in pre-central gyrus right here? And then over here, it says sensory map in post-central gyrus. So let's go back to this picture right here. Pre-central gyrus is the red one. Post-central central gyrus is the blue one. The red one is the primary motor cortex. Where do I get all my motor function uh, generated? And this one is primary somatosensory cortex. Where do I get all that sensory information from my body back? So when I go over here, Here's a little person flopped over this brain, right? This person right here is represented by their body parts scattered on regions of that of those two uh, gyri that control it or get the information back from it. So, and they're also relatively proportional to how much nervous, inf how much uh, brain power is being dedicated to it. So you've got a lot of motor function dedicated to your hand, which is why it looks so big. Look at the person's entire torso and butt. It's smaller, brain power wise, than the, the cortex uh, that's sending information to the, the region of the cortex that's sending information to the hand. Face likewise, really big, right? Especially the, the mouth, lips, tongue. These are really important areas. Uh, you need fine motor control over those kind of things. I need to be able to, to pick up this tissue you know, or I need to pick up an egg without breaking it. So I have really fine motor control as well as really fine, really detailed sensory information coming back. Uh, notice that your legs have very, your legs and back and body have very little fine motor control. You have, you can move them very well, but you can't, there's not a ton of neurons that are going there relative to the ones that go to your hand and, and face. Notice that there's no motor control over your genitalia, but there is some sensory feedback right here, right? So you're getting back sensory information from this, but then it's autonomic nervous system stuff that takes care of, uh, you know, sexual response and so on. So let's look at the sensory. They call this, by, by the way, they call this person a, a homunculus. And a homunculus is an old, oh, Greek, I'm gonna go with Greek term. Um, I'll check my, I'll fact check myself later. But uh, it's an old word that means a, like a little person. So. And there used to be, you could do magic or something. It's like basically like a, like a little representation of a person that, that you can manipulate and maybe you can make the person do something or whatever. But in this case, this homunculus, this is like a little person that is flopped over your brain and represents these different, the allocation of nervous, uh, nervous system uh, energy to the different regions. So again, very little back from your body, but you do got kind of big feet, right? Your feet are big because you want to know what you're stepping on. You don't want to be stepping on thorns and stuff. You want to keep your feet, uh, you want to keep your body aware of where you're walking. Your hands are huge again. Uh, and then also your mouth and uh, lip and tongue and stuff are big. This is your intra-abdominals. This little weak little tube right here is all of the brain power that's dedicated to telling you if you got gas or you got to pee, right? All right, let's go back over to the whiteboard. And we'll talk about what they confusingly call functional regions compared to what they call functional areas. Now, I didn't mention this, but functional areas are found pr pretty much isolated within a lobe. So you can say, I, you can go find the spot 
in the cerebrum that is Broca area, or the motor speech area. But these areas over here, I say they span lobes. So they're kind of spread out over the different lobes. They're not as easy to kind of say it's here or it's here. So they're a little bit more confusing geographically. But I'll, I'm just going to tell you about them. I'm going to list some and then tell you about what they do. So the prefrontal cortex, this is an interesting one. This is a one that is involved in really high level thinking like, like logic and reason and, uh, you know, esoteric stuff like what's right and what's wrong, um, you know, philosophy, kind of who you, who you are as a person uh, mentally, I guess. You know, when, you're, when, you, when I'm trying to think of this, how to explain it, I'm using my prefrontal uh, cortex. Uh, Vertici area, I mentioned it earlier, but I didn't name it, and this is the area that generates the, the uh, words that you're going to make your Broca area say. So when I say, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy sleeping dog, those words were generated in my Wernicke area, and then my Wernicke area communicated with my Broca area to make it say those words. Right? Wernicke area also is the understanding part, part of your uh, brain. So I can read words or hear words or think about things. You know, when I'm thinking, you think in your language pretty much, right? So I'm sitting here thinking about, when I'm thinking, what should I have to eat for dinner tonight? My, I say in my brain, what should I have to eat for dinner tonight? Which is strange, but there you go. And that's my Wernicke area doing that. The Gnostic area, this is a, Gnostic means knowledge. This is kind of your awareness region. So I'm aware almost subconsciously that I'm standing in this room holding a stick, talking to a uh, telephone, right? Uh, the Gnostic area gives you this behavioral self-awareness. If I'm uh, riding a bike, uh, by the way, if I'm riding a bike, I'm using my pre-motor cortex to stay on the bike, and I'm using my Gnostic area to be aware that I'm on the bike, and then I'm going to use my primary motor cortex to get up and you know go faster or to put on the brakes, that kind of thing. See, brains are crazy, man, and I don't understand them hardly, right? I would never want to be a neurologist. So. Let's go to these things. Now we're going to another subject here, basal nuclei. We're still talking about gray matter, still talking about um, the cortex, but these are regions of gray matter that are buried in the white matter. So you're going to find them off the, the main map of the cerebral cortex, and they call them nuclei because they're little pockets of gray matter that are located in the axons of the white matter. And I'm not going to break down their, the individual ones. I'm going to mention one specific one here, the amygdala. But otherwise, I'm just going to kind of tell you what they do. Um, they, they basically uh, allow you to pay attention to stuff. Right? Some one of them or several of them do. They allow you to be subconsciously aware of, of, like, of your surroundings, right? So. I, I know, even though it's not important to me, that there's a periodic table of the elements over there on the board, right? And I know that there's lights on in this room. I'm not paying, I don't have to worry about them. They're, they are there, and I know that, but I'm not having to spend any real energy thinking about it. Uh, this is interesting, walking and stereotyped behaviors. So slow stereotype behaviors. When I walk, I don't have to think that I have to swing my arms. As a matter of fact, if you ever try to walk without swinging your arms, it's real awkward. Where's, where's my, where, where do I go off camera? Am I good right here? Am I on? All right, so no, stay there. I'll walk through. I'm going to walk through without swinging my arms. That took concentration to do that, right? When you walk normally, you're going, your arms are going to swing kind of gently. You're going to transfer your balance from one point to the next, and you're going to just walk, right? If you want to try something on your friends, walk with the wrong arm going forward. Like just walk around with the right arm following the right leg. So, Because they're going to look at you like something's wrong with you, but they won't be able to figure it out. Uh, emotion and mood, there's a region called the amygdala, which you may have heard of. And this is a basal nucleus or pair of basal nuclei that 
kind of helps you de determines what sort of attitude you have or what what your what your feelings are or your emotions for that moment or anyway these are interesting but they're you could do a whole class on them somebody could I could last thing here I'm just going to talk about this and then I'll, I'll show you on the board um, that's left right specialization you may have heard that your brains your cerebrum has two hemispheres right you've got a left and right hemisphere and they are uh, specialized you might hear somebody say that they're <coughs> left-brained or, or right-brained, and there's not really strict left and right-brainedness. Brainedness. Uh, but the left side is kind of uh, your what they call your categorical side, where it's going to deal with facts and figures and language and math and uh, spatial awareness and stuff like that. Whereas the right side, generally speaking, is sort of more uh, perceptual and intuitive. So you're going to do more. Uh, art and music and uh, f you know feelings and uh, you know empathy and stuff like that will be generated mostly by the right side. The right and left sides also control and receive from the opposite side. So when I grab this stick here with my right hand, it's I'm sending the impulses to grab the stick and verifying that I've grabbed the stick in my left brain. When I pass it over to my right, left hand, my right brain has to take over to, to grab it and make sure it's, it's been caught. Same thing works with your eyes, uh, but they do have a communicator in between, right? There's the, there's the uh, corpus callosum is what they call it. And I think I talk about that in the next video. Um, and that's the fibers that go between the left and the right hemisphere. So that you're always kind of, the left and right brain are always aware of each other. So let's go over here just to give you a little table. Uh, that summarizes some of this brain lateralization. And this is a really nice little table. It, most of them have way too much information on there, but this one really boils it down into some simple bullet points, which I, I uh, really do uh, approve of here. So left side gets sensory stimulus from the right side and motor control of the right side and it's speech, language, and comprehension. Uh, this stuff I already talked about. Um, over here, creativity, uh, this is something I didn't mention, but the ability to recognize faces. And uh, interestingly, if you sever, if you sever the, the connection between the left and the right brain, this was done famously in a um, neurological experiment on people that had epilepsy back in the early 1900s when you could just treat people like that. So they would sever the corpus callosum. Uh, and they did that because they noticed that there was an unusual amount of energy, electrical energy being uh, exhibited when the person was having a seizure. So they went in there and cut the col corpus callosum and success. The person's severity of epileptic seizures went way down. But then they started saying, well, how can you just cut this big piece between the middle of the two brains and not have any negative uh, after effects? Recognition of words and recognition of faces and objects. If you're going to call something, if I'm going to call this stick a stick, I have to be able to recognize it and be able to assign a word to it. So in experiments done with these people that had this corpus callosum severed, they would have them open one eye, right? And this is the eye that would go, my right eye goes to my left brain, my left brain recognizes words, but I couldn't tell you what the object was because I, I don't recognize that object. I have the word for stick in my head, but I can't say it because I don't recognize it. If I looked at it with my left eye, I know what it is, but I can't tell you what it is. So really weird stuff. Uh, that's it for this first video.